football group is doing. Last week they had Brady. This week they got Brady. We're doing it. We're literally doing it differently from everybody else. Hey, as a matter of fact, moving forward from this point on, I will not make reference to PFL. <laughs> Do you not understand that they are that way because you're Joe Flacco? And you just like to discredit things that people deserve credit for. That you can't possibly be expected to defend that. Talk about the game, Sam. So Who cares about what people think about us? Yeah, I like football, I like football season, all the things that go with it. Welcome in to the PFF NFL Podcast. Steve Palazzolo here with Sam Monson. Fired up for an off-season May podcast, Sam. You are. You're bringing all kinds of heat, Steve. Nice, well, nice work. On yeah, Monday trying morning. to keep the people engaged all off-season. So today, we are discussing a little bit of NFL news. Saints released a starter, a very good starter. We'll get into a little bit of 2018 quarterback draft class discussion. Everybody wants to hear us discuss Baker Mayfield, Lamar Jackson, Josh Allen again. But we'll try to you know, bring some perspective to all of those guys. Sam Darnold, Josh Rosen, of course, in that mix as well. And then we'll get into predicting offensive and defensive rookies of the year. A couple articles up on PFF.com this past week, handicapping that race. Uh, let's start with this, Sam. The New Orleans Saints, we have to go back and almost kind of redo our draft analysis. We said, what are they doing? They, they draft Cesar Ruiz, center slash guard out of Michigan with their first round pick. Of all the teams that felt like they were going to be, you know, looking at this year only or more than, you know, the future, this looked like a forward looking you know, type of pick. They had one of the best offensive lines in the NFL. Both guards are locked up, making a lot of money. They respond by this week releasing Larry Warford, their starting right guard so it's not a forward-looking pick Cesar Ruiz looks like he's going to start right away at right guard as a rookie yeah I mean I think it's it's definitely a forward-looking pick anyway I don't think our analysis was totally crazy I think we pegged that Larry Warford could become vulnerable because of this um though it felt more like he would be the guy that would lose his job and they would keep him on or trade him or whatever outright cutting him before the season seems a little bit drastic and a little bit just unnecessary I mean You know, what you did with the Ruiz pick is you bought yourself some impressive contingency, which is pretty valuable when you're chasing a Super Bowl. You then get rid of that contingency and potentially downgrade by throwing out a rookie who, even if he's going to be a better player long term, is unlikely to be from from day one. So, you know, Warford, you know, he the best grade of his career was his rookie season. Remember with the Lions where he was absolutely fantastic. He's never really gotten back to that level since. But he's been a solid NFL player the whole way. And last year, he was a solid NFL player. What I don't understand is why they seem so completely against Larry Warford. And yet, Andres Pete, a guy who grades terribly on the regular, was given a monster contract on the other side. Yeah, a Saints uh, beat writer, Nick Underhill, wrote an article. I, I, I don't want to just discuss the headline, but I did – just see the headline and the, the basic premise was they got faster and that they were trying to get faster and that Cesar Ruiz adds a lot of athleticism and uh, which, which he does. He absolutely crushed it at the combine ran a, a 508 40, which was 88th percentile, good shuttle, good 10 yard split, all that stuff. Very athletic. And Warford is one of the slower guards in the NFL. So it sounded like that was part of the saints intentions there. Hey, let's get more athletic up front. I wonder Are they, you know how teams, they have these themes and it's off season and here's how we're going to build. Are they trying to put guys in space more? Are they going to run 10% more screens? Are they going to do more with, you know, pulling guards and getting Taysom Hill and Alvin Kamara out in space? I'm just curious if this actually affects a little bit of their strategy, which does feel like they're thinking about maybe 10% of plays rather than, you know, the 550 or so that, you know, these guys need to just be in pure pass protection to protect the most important guy on the team, Drew Brees. Right. I mean, the interesting way of, of looking at that would be yeah, I mean, a more complex mechanism than just who's got the faster 40. Let's, you know, let's pull up those movement type plays for offensive line. Let's dive into PFF ultimate like the Saints have the capacity to do. Look at the outside zone plays. Look at those plays where you're actually asking those guys to move around and see who has the better, see who has the better grade. See which guys are actually, you know, playing well in those movements and which ones aren't. 
All right. So just that, that was the, the big news. I mean, that's what happens in May. That's one of the big uh, news items this past week. Let's get into this 2018 NFL draft quarterback discussion. Uh, Baker Mayfield went number one overall. We saw uh, Sam Darnold go at number three, Josh Allen at seven, Josh Rosen at 10. Who he's off the top of my head? Are these all right? And uh, Lamar Jackson at the very end of the first round. We're, we've seen all of these guys play for two years. And I just want to uh, bring us all back down to earth based off what we've seen. I want to take out some of the recency bias of uh, Lamar Jackson and Baker Mayfield in that analysis. Yes. Sam. Just a quick rough and dirty thing that I just suggested. Just outside zone plays, right? Quickest way I can get to something on the move. Uh, Larry Warford's grade last season is 20 grading points higher than Andrews Pete in run blocking terms on outside zone plays. So obviously that's the most surface level way you could possibly do that. We could dive yeah. significantly further, but at least on the surface, it appears that like, in terms of actual play, as opposed to 40 time, Warford again has been a better player than Pete for that style of offense. Yeah, so, I mean, you Warford know, maybe gave Ruiz up. is moving in the right direction, but again, I just don't understand why you would love Andrews Pete and hate Larry Warford if that's what you're going for. I also wonder if this is the Saints trying to be a year ahead on guys uh, regressing a little bit. Warford did give up the most pressures of his career last year, but mm -hmm. it wasn't like, you know, his tank. Uh, his grade tanked or anything like that. He has been a very solid pass protector. It was a 71.4. He's been above 70 every year of his career, but it was his lowest grade and the most pressures. So um, again, I think when teams make decisions, a lot of times it's based off of, we've seen Larry Warford play for the last three years. This was his uh, worst pass protecting year. We saw him get worse. It was his best run blocking year with the Saints, by the way. But um, I wonder if it's just, you know, a reaction to what they saw as a player and not necessarily a reaction to how he stacks up across the league, which is still a well above average guard uh, all mm -hmm. around as far as Warford. All right, getting back to this 2018 NFL draft class, I don't think anybody that's listened to this podcast uh, is unfamiliar with uh, what we thought about Baker Mayfield coming out as the clear number one. Uh, he looked all, all sorts of that guy um, as a rookie. I mean, he looked like, all right, this guy looks like he's the next – top eight to 10 quarterback in the league, absolutely regressed in 2019. And so the question, so let's start with this question. Baker Mayfield was awesome in 2018, regressed last year. Lamar Jackson stepped in and they kind of built an offense around him in 2018, won a bunch of games. He still showed some inaccurate inaccuracy problems last year, really built an offense around them. We've talked about that quite a bit and they absolutely crushed it. Looks like their trajectories are going in completely different ways. What do you make of those two guys at this point after two years? Well, let me start by asking you a question. Um, of that group of quarterbacks, that draft class of quarterbacks, who is the quarterback you feel most confident in that we actually know who they are right now? Lamar Jackson. Because I think literally the only one of that class that we know, know who they are is Luke Falk, who remains terrible. <laughs> Every single other one is some degree of question mark or other. Um, I would say, so I think Lamar, even if Lamar regress, regresses a little bit from an accuracy standpoint, I still think he gets you like a baseline of success between the run game and creating open throws that like, I feel good about where he's, what he's yeah. going to be. So but I don't know. I mean, that's also the first year that he was that accurate. After right. Many years of not. The other one is... Um, I think Josh Rosen is sunk as a career back of a best, not necessarily because that's all he is, but because at this point, I, he doesn't have an opportunity to do anything else, right? He's had two of the worst possible starting situations to an NFL career, and that has essentially consigned him to life as somebody's backup unless he gets a shot down the line to do something different. So he's, he's stuck in that rut. Mason Rudolph, probably the same thing, although for different reasons, he's just, he didn't look, didn't do anything when he got starting opportunities to suggest that he was going to be a starter down the line. So he, again, is probably consigned to life as a career backup, which leaves you with that four of Josh Allen, Sam Darnold, Baker Mayfield, and Lamar Jackson. Um, Lamar last season, MVP caliber year, looked phenomenal, was obviously incredible as a runner, but all the important things was the development of his game as a passing threat. And 
he was always a fascinating player because he he was more he did more quarterback passing things than most um, dual threat or most sort of you know athletic rushing in, in quotation marks quarterbacks right um, and this was the first time that we actually saw him sort of unleash that and actually become an accurate an accurate enough passer so that those gifts made a difference or made an important difference um, where his analysis because so the, the question with all these quarterbacks I think is have we overreacted too much to 2019 because it's the last thing we saw right because development is never this linear curve of you get better every single year and that's why thank you for if, using my my lines thank you for even when me. you're um evaluating these guys as college prospects one of the most confusing things is what happens if the guy's previous season was better than the final one right like what the yep. hell do you do with that because you expect them to get better every single year and if they don't it's confusing as hell now you're in like this is the same situation in the nfl right some of these guys had much better first years baker mayfield in particular much better rookie year than his second season so what do you do do you throw out the rookie year because the second season was so bad or do you say, well, okay, no, like we've already seen a higher level of play than this, so we should expect him to come back somewhere. Yeah, so just recent examples, right? Uh, Carson Wentz, in his second year, was an MVP candidate, gets hurt at the end of the year. That was 2017. I think he led the league in touchdowns, even despite the injury. I mean, he was uh, – he had taken a great step forward in 2017. Uh, he has not played – to that level, at least statistically since that point, and probably in, but he also hasn't made the same, same number of big plays, the third down conversions, the tight window throws. So you could say that Wentz looked in 2017, like, okay, he had an okay rookie season, 2017, he's an MVP candidate. Boom. He's here to stay, right? Linear progression. He's always going to get better. He's kind of leveled off a little bit and actually um, just kind of come back down to earth. Jared Goff looked like he was, classic all right he's just going to get better every year right was a disaster as a rookie Sean McVay shows up 2017 wow he's much better 2018 was the one time he ranked as a top 10 quarterback last year he regresses back right so it's not Madden right you start off as a 70 and you're 74 then you're an 80 then you're an 82 and it just keeps getting better until you're 40 right Jared Goff regressed last year Derek Carr 2014 as a rookie not good 2015, amazing step forward. And then 16, uh, even bigger step forward. He looks like, okay, this guy's going to be a top 10 quarterback for the foreseeable future. And he's come back down to earth 17, 18, and 19. So um, that's, the, that's like the caveat at play here is that guys don't just get better every single season, right? Um, there are many quarterbacks uh, where this is, this is the case. Right. And then you have it. So the same thing is true, but works in a different way for a guy like Lamar Jackson, right? He took such a monstrous leap forward in year two. The chance of him getting better from that point are minimal. The chance of him getting worse from that point, I would say, are relatively significant um, compared with a guy like Patrick Mahomes, say, who has already done enough to suggest that he's actually going to be at that level all the time. Right? He's so not here's the thing down to earth to a degree. Here's the thing I'll say about Lamar. Um, because I mentioned this on the last podcast, because he's still a young quarterback relative to some of the other guys on the list because of how he played in high school. Granted at Louisville, again, advanced passing concepts and all that stuff. Didn't have, didn't throw the ball a ton, but he was, he has gotten better every single year, pretty much from his freshman year at Louisville uh, through now. So there's, it's not that he's going to take the same number of steps forward, but there's, I feel like there's a better chance that, hey, Lamar kind of is what he is. Like, you're going to – even if teams start taking away some of the runs, because of the advances he's made in the passing game, he's kind of here to stay. You know, like, I think he's more likely than the other guys. Um, I think another component to this is an article I wrote a few weeks back, uh, late March, about the supporting cast. I ranked the supporting cast of recent first-round quarterbacks, so the 2018 class and the 2019 class. So it includes Kyler and Daniel Jones and all that stuff. But relevant to this discussion, right now the supporting cast that I ranked for this class of 2018 has Josh Allen, number one, Lamar Jackson, number two, Baker Mayfield, number three. And let's go back to the draft. After their rookie seasons, Lamar and Baker kind of had 
enough supporting cast to work with. The three guys who had probably bottom three, they were battling. Who's got the worst group of offensive linemen and receivers to throw to? It was Josh Allen, Sam Darnold, and Josh Rosen. Remember their rookie seasons. Josh Rosen had to be the worst, right? That mm-hmm. offensive line was a disaster. Receiving core was bad. But since that time, the Buffalo Bills have done a great job of first attacking the offensive line, throwing numbers at the line, adding John Brown and Cole Beasley, and now adding Stephon Diggs. I think they've got the best supporting cast. Sam Darnold is still ranking near the bottom. And, of course, Josh, Josh Rosen has, as you mentioned, had the worst situations as far as teammates go and opportunity and just, you know, not being great when he's actually been out there. So yeah. they, everybody's gone in different directions as far as supporting cast. So let's go to Josh Allen quickly. He is the, he is the guy that we think – didn't play nearly as great as the team record last year. I still think he's got some game changing ability in him that will kind of keep him lurking around, but is he ever going to take that next step to be a more efficient down to down quarterback? Because there were also bouts of of really poor play last year from Allen. Yeah. And you know, the, it's difficult trying to um, isolate things on a per game basis right it's sample size is crazy it's just silly but there's something to the idea that tom brady you know when everything when the chips are down when the situation mandates it tom brady is at his best he's cool calm and collected and he doesn't fold right there's probably also something to the fact that when the same situation presented itself with josh allen he imploded in the postseason in a more spectacular fashion than I think I've ever seen a quarterback implode just detonated right down to that crazy lateral thing out of the back door that was just lunacy so that is concerning I think as much as anything like if you're going to be a relatively volatile big play quarterback at the very minimum you need to be able to summon those skills when they most count right because you're not going to have the down and down efficiency of a Tom Brady a Drew Brees those kinds of guys so if, you're, if your big calling card is going to be these special plays that nobody else can manage, you need to be able to summon them at the right time. Otherwise, it's just, well, okay, earlier in the first quarter, he made this special throw, and now it doesn't matter because he can't make a routine, you know, 10-yard out. Well, we're going to be told that he didn't throw a fourth down intercept or a fourth quarter interception or all these different things from the regular season or whatever it is. Um, again, he had um, some turnover luck, uh, one of which was, I think it was the Broncos game, I mean, they, he, they had the game-winning drive. He also fumbled on his way to the goal line. I can't remember if it was he, him that uh, recovered it or not, but somebody recovered it. I mean, so again, the play-by-play grading is isolating the fact that he has far more negative grades than right. most other quarterbacks. So, so you know what's um, really interesting about his numbers, though? Um, because you start talking about Josh Allen, and it's, it's still a conversation about accuracy, and you know he hasn't really necessarily improved that. And then you get people on Twitter who will – pull up all these highlight clips of these lasers, these perfect passes, you know, drilled in at the tight coverage. A bunch of those. Yeah. Right. And so this is the thing when you, when you actually look at PFF's uh, ball location data for year one versus year two, almost every single number is exactly the same except accuracy plus. Right. And those are the absolute perfect, perfect passes exactly where they need to go. The ones that get pulled up on those highlight reels and his accuracy plus number almost doubled. So he went from 8.6% to 16.8%. He basically doubled the amount of those perfect passes he has, but basic accuracy actually went down a hair, a percentage point. Um, can, or catchable, inaccurate, uncatchable, inaccurate. Those are about the same. Like every number he had essentially stayed exactly where it was, except he made double the amount of those absolute lasers and those are the ones that you pull up on a highlight reel and say, hey, see, of course he's accurate. Now, the point is, like, moving that needle is great, but the thing that might, makes a far bigger difference to your down-to-down efficiency is shifting the rest, the basic accuracy stuff, the ones that you need to be able to hit, because no matter whether you're 8% or 16%, you don't make enough of those big throws for that to be the thing that you're hanging your hat on. Here's, here's how they become better, more efficient. I'll give, I'm going to give you reason for optimism and reason for pessimism uh, right, for Josh it. Allen. Here's the optimism, right? Uh, the same thing we've said about Lamar Jackson, who, again, 
ball location wise hasn't been great. He added those accuracy pluses last year as well. Those, those high end perfect throws. Um, we, we always mention how Lamar helps open up uh, receivers because of his rushing ability, because he changes the math. Having Stephon Diggs there now, along with Cole Beasley and John Brown and Dawson Knox and a better offensive line should have more open throws. So even if the ball location isn't better, as long as you don't completely miss these guys, you should be able to complete a higher percentage of passes. So more open throws plus Josh Allen's rushing ability, plus those couple running backs they have in the backfield now between Singletary and Zach Moss who can make guys miss. I mean, this is a tough offense to defend. So I can see raw numbers getting better for Josh Allen should have more open throws, at least make them catchable, right? The one other piece of optimism he improved greatly in the up to 20 yard range. I mean, he was fantastic there uh, from a grading standpoint last year compared to his previous years. The part that fluctuates though, is the 20 plus yard throws. He was a disaster compared to the rest of the league. Like he was in a completely different world and ballpark on 20 plus yard passes. But those are the ones, again, they a little bit more unstable tend to fluctuate on the pessimistic side. Josh Allen ranked 39th out of 39 qualifiers in negatively graded throws. And when, when, he, when we talk about stable metrics year to year, like that's the one. And when we talk about, could you have projected, could you have looked at the 2017 Jaguars who went to the AFC championship and predicted regression the next year because of their defense and quarterback? Yes. Easy, easy regression team, right? 2018. Could you have predicted Mitchell Trubisky, you know, fall, you know tapering off last year because they were relying on a defense in the bears in 2018 and Trubisky again, ranking near the top of negatively graded throws. Yes. Easily, easy prediction. Josh Allen and the Bills, they've had three good years defensively. And also, uh, Allen has not really improved his negatively graded throws. So, yes, there is, they are a huge regression candidate from that perspective. However, losing Brady in the AFC East also yeah. works against them. So, there's a lot of things pushing against each other here, I think, for the Bills. That, so, the, the fact that those negatively graded throws are so stable is a concerning thing for Allen and, and added to the fact that his percentage of uncatchable essentially misses. His, his percentage of missed throws has basically stayed exactly the same year to year. Other things have moved, so his overall performance, his numbers have gotten a little bit better, but that number stayed the same, and that number is the thing that will place a firm cap on how good he can be. And that number, A, it's like almost it's 12% higher than like the better players in the NFL. But more concerning is the players <laughs> that are in the same ballpark in that statistic. So Josh Rosen, worst player in the NFL in terms of percentage of un uh, uncatchable, inaccurate passes um, last year. But Josh Allen's two seasons back to back are in the same ballpark as Blaine Gabbert, um, Jeff Driscoll. Josh Rosen again, um, and Mitchell Trubisky. So it's like a who's who of quarterbacks that are, have problems and cannot be successful. Now, yeah. Allen has upside that some of those guys don't have because of those absolute lasers, the perfect passes, et cetera. But Plus the this, rushing ability. Right, but this is the number. Like this is the thing that was the yep. concern coming out is that he is not accurate enough to be a good player. And, you know, the... One of the players I think that he got compared to, I think that I compared him to, was Carson Wentz, right? Who, again, is not one of the most accurate quarterbacks in the NFL, but makes a lot of big plays to offset those. Like, Wentz is significantly higher up on this list than, than Allen is. Like, that's where you and, need to be. And Wentz is five percentage points better off. So and significantly higher that, in, in big-time throw percentage. You're, right, but my point is, like, let's say for, for the second that they're equals on that. Even if they're yeah. equal there... Wentz is five percentage points better off in terms of the number of passes he's thrown into the dirt or airmailing over a receiver's head. Like right. if Allen can't move that number and it probably as far as five percentage points, he's probably capped in terms of how good he can be. And this was in a season when they did a lot to help him with the short stuff, right? They did give him more opportunities. Right. They did, they, they, they used uh, favor, favorable, they passed on favorable downs, and they so they did. They have done a good job scheming it but up. Even uh, like the Trubisky thing for a second. Think about that. Like Trubisky is now a meme for like inaccurate passing, right? Like every time there's a video where you go through NFL quarterbacks, like Trubisky is the guy thrown into a building, or you know, it's like how how far is social distancing? Well, think about how far Trubisky's intended receiver is from the ball that gets there. 
Like Trubisky right. has become a joke for an accuracy, and Trubisky throws a fewer throws a, a lower percentage of inaccurate, uncatchable passes than Josh Allen does. Like that is how inaccurate he was over the last two years. So that's something to keep an eye on. I want to circle back to Lamar. If you just look at his stable metrics, the things that can project to next year, he was well above average in everything that you're looking for. The lowest one, however, though, was still avoiding negatives. He was in the 59th percentile against the rest of the, uh, the 39. So that was more middle of the pack. So again, that is the most stable number out of all these. Um, the place where he could also regress third and fourth down, where he was 85th percentile as far as his PFF grade, 85th percentile under pressure. So again, using, I think, I think Carson Wentz 2017 is a good comp for Lamar Jackson, right? A guy who took huge step forward in year two, became an MVP candidate, and then kind of settled back into to where he is as a quarterback. So um, not taking anything away from Lamar. Like we have to preface this a million times. Like he was amazing last year. He was awesome. I think he deserved the MVP even with what our war, war numbers said, right? Uh, forget our war for a second. Like he was fine as the MVP of the Ravens for what he brings to the table. But as a passer, he took huge steps forward. There are points of his game that are likely to regress. In addition to the fact that the Ravens were incredible from a uh, percentage standpoint going forward on fourth down, we actually saw that regress. They went over two against the Titans in the playoff game early on. Right. So those are the types of things that should come back down to earth. And on top of that, our guy Timo is going to write an article on the website today saying, take the under on 11 wins for the Ravens, which isn't a knock. It's just like play the odds here. It's going to be really tough for them to duplicate what they did last year. So Lamar is interesting because he was in exactly the same place as Josh Allen in terms of percentage of those misses. Right. Year one, he was at 26 percent. That's basically exactly where Allen was the past two years. He moved that number six percentage points last year right he went yep. from 26 percent passes just not catchable misses to 20. now 20 isn't among the best quarterbacks in the nfl but it's no longer a problem like it, it moves him from the ass end of the league in terms of accuracy to middle of the pack somewhere and that was what he needed to achieve that is the move that josh allen needs to make to be a, a quality quarterback and it's the move that lamar did make now two questions one is that sustainable like because that's a number that typically is fairly uh, consistent and predictive did he somehow buck the trend and do something that isn't possible to repeat year on year or did he fundamentally change who he is did he develop this level of accuracy that people like to say is impossible you can't teach accuracy you can't develop it maybe he did he did at least year to year and then the other interesting thing with Lamar is he is tied to his offensive scheme in a way these other guys aren't um, and I don't this is not a criticism, right? This is just reality. Lamar, we said all the way along that there is this path to Lamar Jackson being a really good NFL quarterback, but it looks different to anybody else's path because it needs to look like what it looks like right now, which is this run-heavy system, not to protect him, but that actually enhances everything he does, right? It plays to his strengths, it minimizes his weaknesses, and it actually means that his weaknesses are, get easier opportunities. The stuff that he does well as a passing quarterback is made easier by everything else that happens, by the multiple tight end sets, by the fact that things come off run fakes, by the fact that everybody's terrified that, of, of what he can do with his legs. Everything works together. This is the perfect offense for Lamar Jackson to run. On the other hand, he probably is dependent on this offense to a great degree, right? So what it, do you do with that from an analysis point of view? Well, so here's the other thing, though, too. Uh, by the way, last year when, we, when we're saying build the offense around him, part of building the offense around him is telling him, is letting him stay in the pocket and go through his reads because he loves doing it, right? And again, last year he had the third highest percentage of what we call next reads. So essentially you start, you get to the top of your drop, you work one side of the field. That's your first side. We'll call that your first read. When you move to another side of the field, we'll call that your next read, right? So you're getting to some other part of the progression. He's done that. Not only did he do that, the second highest percentage of any quarterback coming out of college in the draft class, he's third in the entire NFL doing that last year. So part of this play to his skill set is to give him true drop back passing concepts that he's comfortable with that where he's going to work and, and try to find the open man. There's other points of, hey, Marquise Brown, who is a legitimate deep threat, who the Ravens, it felt like there was a trend around the NFL to put your 4-3 speedster in the slot and just let him go last year, especially early in the season. 
they were doing that with Marquise Brown. He was a little banged up for the rest of the year, but they haven't unleashed him yet. They've got more speed with Devin Duvernay, right? So just like there's always like, hey, watch out for these things coming back down to earth. But on the other hand, there's a couple exciting things, I think, for Ravens fans as far as more speed on the field, more creative ways to use them in year three. I think Lamar will be a good test case, though, for the linear improvement in certain areas. Um, if it's because he was coming from a lower baseline coming out of high school, or if there's just so much data of him being below, you know, below NFL level from an accuracy standpoint, having one year above average is, is an anomaly rather than a, a progression. Um, yeah. All that said, Patrick Mahomes has bucked all of those. There's always outliers. I, Patrick Mahomes, I think even for the people that loved Patrick Mahomes as a player, he's still a data anomaly because he took a lot of his weaknesses and, and either mitigated them or turned them into strengths in part because of the system and Andy Reid and his situation, but also because he's just uh, improved greatly. I want to circle back to that a bit later when we talk about some of the questions, when we talk, answer questions. So let's, let's put a pin in the Mahomes thing and come back to it a bit later. But I, I think the Lamar thing is interesting because as much, the offense isn't going anywhere, right? Like you might be tied to it, but John Harbaugh is one of the most tenured and secure coaches in the NFL. The Ravens are doing really well. Their analytics um, is on the cutting edge. So they're doing smart things, which will only help everybody overall, like everything that's there that's enabling Lamar Jackson to be successful is not going anywhere anytime soon. So to an extent, it's a moot point, right? Like this is a fundamental part of his success, but it will continue to be because it's not disappearing. Uh, I just think it's an important thing. It's an important distinction to make when you compare him to some other quarterbacks, whether it's Sam Darnold or Baker Mayfield, who not only have they not had like an offense custom built around them to do to accentuate what they do well and to minimize what they do badly. But if anything, they've been in environments that have worked against them. Um, you know, Darnold, the situation around him has been a little shy of a disaster. And as much as Baker Mayfield had a ton of talent assembled around him, like the coaching and system and scheme was bad enough that they kicked everybody out of the building after a year of trying it, right? right. So it was, it was bad. Um, so he, they, those guys don't get the benefit of that stuff working in their favor. But I think, Lamar, you're right. I think he is here to stay. I think what we saw last year in terms of development is probably not something that's going to disappear. So the only thing remaining to be seen is, does the league figure out a better mechanism for dealing with that offense, right? Because usually these things, they hit the ground running in the NFL. They devastate it. Think Sean McVay and the Rams, right? And then after about a year, teams understand how to take it away. And if you don't evolve, if you don't take it on to the next level, it starts to founder. And that's exactly what happened with the Rams. They never figured out how to evolve this thing, take it to version 2.0, and consequently their offense wasn't as good anymore. Now, offensive line, et cetera, played into that. But that was a big thing, right? The Ravens are now reaching this point where have teams figured out how to slow this thing down yet? And if so, what's next? Do they have... Well, do they have the next iteration in the arms race to stay ahead of defenses if they start to figure it out? All right, let's, uh, let's wrap up the 2018 class with a few minutes on Baker Mayfield and then a few minutes on Darnold. Um, as far as Baker goes, yeah, absolutely regressed last year. It was also one of those situations where he graded a little bit better, I think, than the stats would have showed. Had some bad interception luck. You mentioned there, was, there were pieces of the offense. I mean, just overall, this offense was bad. Couldn't complete a shovel pass dig route you know just there was there was no precision to it so I think my question is more it, Baker's regression was he was it started with him just not trusting his offensive line and completely not playing within structure he had 117 dropbacks that ended up outside the pocket not necessarily you know design rollouts and scrambles 117 that were essentially not all outside of structure, but a big chunk of them were, and he didn't grade all that. He was okay grading on that. He's fine outside the pocket. But this was like, from one of his, his first dropbacks last year, it was like, oh, no, Greg Robinson's you know, protecting my blind side. Let me get out of here. Um, so my question's more, how does Kevin Stefanski rein that in? Are, is this going to be a situation where a little bit less pressure's on Baker Mayfield? And if you're dropping back, 30, say, 35 times in a game, eight to ten of those are, quote, unquote, easy. Maybe 15 of them are easy. That's where the boot stuff comes in, a good screen game, some misdirection, some quick game, so that you don't have to be the guy for 35 dropbacks. 
you could be the guy for 20 or 15, right? Where you just, you know, drop back and be, be a top 10 quarterback that people think that you could be. So I'm just wondering how much the scheme is going to help create some easy throws, take a little pressure off, and, and then you can go, uh, you know, be the guy on third downs when you need to, but, you know, less often. Yeah, it, so we talked about this with the boss, with Chris Collinsworth and our, whatever, the, the schedule release show we had the other day. And I was like, what the hell happened with Baker Mayfield, right? And because he, he, so you know, we, we were talking about when he came out, it's not like he was flawless. He had flaws to his game. It's just that they manifested themselves so infrequently, it felt like nitpicking, right? It's like every now and again, he gets happy feet in the pocket, fails in a clean pocket, and, you know, th- those are things you shouldn't be doing, right? Stay in there, make the yeah. throw you're supposed to. Like, but it, it, it didn't matter. So, and it happened so infrequently. I was like, why even bring it up? Like all this other stuff is so much bigger. So last season, all the negatives that he was, all the negatives in terms of running away from pressure, feeling phantom pressure, all that, trying to play sort of hero ball when he shouldn't, all that stuff was there on his college tape. It's just it was such a fraction of, of how often it happened last year. Now, the question is, what caused it like what caused him to lean into his own flaws in 2019 was it greg robinson and was this the sort of start of the kurt warner mark bulger era rams where that offensive line fell to pieces and those guys just got broken like they started off great and then after a while you're now feeling the pressure even when it's not there and that's when you start to get broken as an nfl quarterback was that what was happening to Baker, that the situation was so bad that even when Greg Robinson wasn't getting his ass kicked, like Baker didn't know that, so he was running away anyway. Yeah. Or Oh, there were definitely some plays where Robinson was fine and Baker was making it look far worse. Right, yep. but my point is, was that, a, was that a consequence of the plays where he was getting beaten, or was that just Baker starting to lean into this rut and start to play yep. badly, right? So this entire offseason for them has been about trying to eliminate those variables. Let's get better on the offensive line so that it's no longer a thing that could be causing him to do what he's doing. Let's get in a guy like Stefanski who will create these play action, easier plays, simple reads so that he's already on the move and he doesn't have to run away from anything. Um, Let's get, you know, so all the offseason moves they made were about essentially ticking off things that could be to blame, right? These other things like coaching staff got changed. All these other things are things that if you were looking to excuse Baker, you would say, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? They're, the Browns offseason was about like ticking those off. Nope, not, a, not an excuse anymore. Not right. an excuse anymore. Not an excuse anymore. This season, it's all Baker Mayfield. So if he can't fix leaning into those mistakes, he's probably done. Like he might get a second shot anywhere, but he's going to get run out of the Browns because that was concerning. But – if those things were legitimate reasons, like this was the root cause, Baker Mayfield's play was a symptom, not the actual virus, um, then you should expect him to bounce back because what we saw from a rookie showed that he can make the big plays, that he can be accurate enough, that he can do what he needs to do. The funny thing about all this is what was the narrative a year ago at this time, or at least ours, right? What we had seen from Baker Mayfield as a rookie was the first half of the season and the second half of the season, he actually had the same exact PFF grade, which was above average. It was good. But his stats really took off in the second half of the season after Hugh Jackson was fired and after Freddie Kitchens took over the play calling. So last year at this time, we're like, wait a second. Okay. It looks like the offense is in good shape. They add Odell Beckham to Freddie Kitchens' play calling. But it was kind of like Baker's one weakness that we thought coming out was, ah, oh, you know, inviting pressure and, you know, bailing on clean pockets. We thought that the one weakness for the Browns could be, hey, Freddie's inexperienced as a coach. Can he pull it all together? And while it was one weakness, it was a pretty strong one, strong enough that he's been fired after one year. So my big question for this offense is the attention to detail, their inability to complete a shovel pass, the number of times that Odell Beckham's running a dig route at 20 yards instead of 18 or running a post or an out, just they're just not at the – level of detail that you need at the NFL level, which always still amazes me, Sam, that quarterbacks can throw blindly at a spot 22 yards along the sideline and the, the dude's there. Like, it's it's crazy that it works all as, as often as it does, but when it's bad, it's ugly, and it's like, why aren't these guys on the same page? This offense was as bad as I've seen as far as quarterback, receiver, and everyone being on the same page. If Stefanski can tidy up some of the, the details, sneak some easier throws in there, take a little bit of pressure off, I think we see Baker 
bounce back. And again, we go back to the data that says of we have five years of grading on Baker Mayfield and four of them, he's graded well above his peers. Yeah. Um, last year was the one, right? Even so if, if we're, if we're, if we're, if we're saying don't look at linear progression and just the fact that he's gone down means it's going to continue, then we would expect him to, to bounce back here. Even if you just look at two year PFF grade, like Baker is a clear second to Lamar Jackson. Like Lamar is up on his own because last season was so phenomenal, but Baker is the only other guy above 70 um, for over a two year sample. Darnold is, is 10 points further down, Josh Allen 10 points further down, and you know, the rest of those guys. So the, the two concerning things with Baker were one, that feeling of why is he bouncing from all these pockets? That's a bad thing because like I say, the Mark Bulger thing, that's the starting point of like disaster. Like that has ruined plenty of good quarterbacks in the past once that thing starts to happen. The other thing is where the hell did his accuracy go? Because that was, you know, a basic well, hallmark is yeah. like absolute pinpoint accuracy, like above and beyond what you expect, even for accurate quarterbacks. Last year, his accuracy was not good. Like even, even when he had the chance to make a throw, he was not putting it where it should be. And that, that's weird because that, that shouldn't it's, evaporate the way it did. If we're going to talk about negatively graded th throws and their stability, Baker two years over the last two years is in the 35th percentile out of 51 Right. qualifiers so that's below average and that would be a concern as, as a very stable metric uh, one of the newcomers here at PFF Seth Galina was I don't know if he wrote it up yet but we were talking a little bit about um, his evaluation of Baker and what he saw we agreed on a bunch of stuff and the thing that he added to what I said is him throwing essentially with one speed um, and just throwing lasers in there and I, that could be part of the concern is the short stuff you know the throws to backs things like that where he's just not taking enough off of the ball right now and you know his he's just so locked into uh creating big time throws firing the ball up the seam and the cover two shots and the things that he does really well because he's got a cannon for an arm remember he was right behind josh allen as far as best arm in this class and then it wasn't i mean allen was in his own league then i think baker was in his next own league and then it was darnold and rosen and lamar and all the rest of the guys um so he's got a he's got to throw with a little bit better touch right um, and that that in and of itself, the fact that he became like he went in the NFL, he's been in the 35th percentile in terms of those negatively graded throws. Like that in and of itself is a departure from the usually stable statistic, right? Because that's stark contrast to what it looked like in college. Um, over two years, he's basically been where Lamar has been in terms of the, those percentage of uncatchable throws. It's not that, like, it's not catastrophic, but it's way different than where we thought we, he would be, right? He's a He's at that 20%-ish range. Now, last season, it was 21.7. The year before, it was 18.8. .8, so it went in the wrong direction. But even that is like, A, it's five percentage points better than Josh Allen. So he's still not like catastrophic. But B, like he's in the middle of the pack, lower middle of the pack for a statistic we expected him to be right. at the top of. That is in and of itself kind of strange. And I think without explanation, like I don't have a good reason for that changing the way it did so what could happen is so when when that number stays relatively stable and you have and guys have good years that becomes the cam newton season the carson palmer yeah. season the peak season because the positives fluctuate and the positives fluctuate when the offense around them gets better so uh, whether it's lamar baker josh allen like josh allen has a chance to still put up good numbers this year because his positive grades could go through the roof even with his inaccuracy remaining as is um, it's just a, a riskier proposition when you're coming from that low. I mean, let's let's wrap it up with Sam Darnold here. Well, let's and, bottom bottom line on Baker is last year was massively concerning. Like if you're if you're a Baker yep. stan, and basically the entirety of PFF is on the basis that you know we had him graded so highly coming out, and he graded so well as a rookie, making you know confirming the priors, making us seem like we're geniuses. Like year two was massively concerning because not only was he significantly worse. But the things that he got worse at, A, are potentially predictive, like the negatively graded throws, et cetera, and B, have ruined quarterbacks in the past. They've been the start of a rut that they never climbed their way out of. So this is a huge year for Baker. Like He needs to bounce back because they've eliminated everything else as a possible excuse. And if he doesn't, then like his career is, is in trouble. All right, let's wrap it up with Sam Darnold like the other guys heading into year three and 
you know, I think the big story about Darnold is we haven't seen him with a great supporting cast. We haven't seen him with a good offensive line. We haven't seen him with good playmakers to throw to. We've seen Josh Allen's get better. We've seen Josh Rosen just straight up get benched. And Baker and Lamar both walked into situations where they had reasonable playmakers, reasonable line, and or play callers and system and all that stuff. Sam Darnold hasn't had that opportunity. I would say on the concerning end, as I look at every one of his seasons stacked up side by side here, the best season we've seen from Darnold was his redshirt freshman year in 2016. It was one of the things that sold me the most on him. And like you mentioned, what happens to guys who peak uh, their second to last year of college, right? And that was Darnold. As a redshirt freshman, there's only two other redshirt freshmen that I remember off the top of my head that was just like, wow, these guys are next level. This is incredible. It was Andrew Luck and Jameis Winston. Both of those guys, it's like, hey, these guys look like future number ones. They were good NFL quarterbacks. That's what Donald looked like in 2016. He regressed in 2017, goes to the NFL draft, hasn't been great since being in the NFL. The other thing about Donald is he is now putting together a pretty impressive run of consistent inconsistency. So the thing about Donald is that there is a four-game stretch every season of his career that makes you think this guy is Peyton Manning. Right. Yeah. And it, it, it's only a four game stretch and then it disappears and it becomes crappy again. And yet in almost every single scenario, there's something else that you can put it down to. Right. Oh, we got mono. And then at the end of the season, he was healthy again. Now he's looking like a superstar. And then, oh, he was a rookie and the situation of him was bad. But look at December. That's that's the that's the QB of the future. So, and even like in, co- it's like in college, it was if you take away this five game stretch, he was the worst Let me quarterback give you- in, the, in the nation. He was great. Let me give you that history because this circles back to the discussion at the beginning, linear growth, right? If you were expecting linear growth from Sam, here are the things we've used as excuses for him, right? In 2017, if you take away three games, he's the number three graded quarterback in the entire country. However, in those three games, he was like dead last. Like it was bad. It was Hackenbergian. It was bad, right? Um, 2018, he was highest graded or one of our highest graded over the last, as you mentioned, month of the season. So you would say, okay, rookie, he peaked late at – so did Geno Smith, by the way. Twice. He peaked late – twice. Geno Smith was like Mr. Week 17. He peaked late as a rookie. You're like, oh, he's getting it, right? Mm-hmm. You flip the switch. He's good. He's got it. He's peaking late. Last year, the mono wow. thing, he's seeing ghosts early in the season, finishes strong, but he did taper off. It, it is a roller coaster ride for Sam Darnold. So the minute you think he's got it, don't get fooled because – you know, these things even off, it's not this, it's not a linear progression. But it's great because he is like the definition of a can-do quarterback right now because guys like you and Dan Orlovsky, they throw on the tape and they're like, God, I love what he does. Like, look at these There's plays. so many good things on there, yeah. Right, and then it's like, okay, but it doesn't actually do them that often and the things where he's not doing them, they're terrible. So like, have you considered well, the possibility that Sam Darnold is just bad? Well, here's the thing I thought about him too, right? I thought – what coming out, he he had some Philip Rivers esque anticipation in the middle of the field. I mean, there were there were some spectacular throws. The grades backed it up. He was awesome throwing to the middle of the field. He was awesome at things that are generally that generally translate at the next level. So all passes up to twenty yards. He had good touch. He had good feel, and he had a little outside the pocket magic. I thought all of that stuff would add up to this baseline of good. For Donald and I'm in the same thing I mentioned about Josh Allen earlier whereas if you're good at up to 20 yards the the deep stuff the 20 plus yard stuff will fluctuate based off of your performance a little bit but also based off who you have right if you have Randy Moss or Deshaun Jackson or Tyree Kill it doesn't matter if you're a bad deep ball thrower your numbers will improve or if you just have a guy that's going to go up and catch it for you contested catches they just fluctuate so I figured Donald would have this baseline of good and then he'd stumble into some years where his deep talent was really good down the field, and they would just make some plays for him, and it didn't matter because he was really inaccurate throwing the ball down the field uh, at USC. That hasn't changed much uh, with the Jets, but he hasn't had anybody besides Robbie Anderson to kind of stretch the field. Um, all of that said, he's still sitting there with the worst supported cast out of this entire group minus Josh Rosen who's sitting on the bench. Right. So, so what a- do we know about Sam Darnold heading into year three? That's the thing, right, is that he's now, like, he has this incredible stretch of consistent inconsistency, and yet, it like, he, there's this laundry list of excuses for him, but they're valid. Like, that's why it's weird, is that 
you know, last year, Baker Mayfield, you can tick off the three or four things. You can say, well, these things may have been causing all this. Darnold's got those constantly. And I don't know that they're going to erase themselves this year. I know they've, they've gone into this giant rebuilding project. They've brought in like six new offensive linemen. But like, there's a chance that those, like none of those guys are slam dunks. Like even the guys that had their best year last year and it was good, there was a lot of bad before those years. So like there is a not inconsiderable chance that the complete offensive line overhaul is not even that much better than the one before it, which was a disaster. The receiving core has been rebuilt, but it's been rebuilt with guys that are still question marks. Like as much as I love Denzel Mims, there are guys out there that hated him. And like he might not move the needle for your receiving core. And you've got rid of Robbie Anderson, who was your consistent deep threat. Like they have gone on this complete overhaul renovation project for everything around Sam Darnold. And there's a there's a possibility that nothing has gotten better around it. Yeah, I think so. I think the the issue here is that more that the the Jets are trying to do what the Bills did, which is build really um, a nice scenario around Darnold. Uh, but they got started a year late, uh, part because their own you know poor drafting and selections and maneuvering the board and all that stuff. But they're trying. They're trying really hard. I could picture this best say, best case scenario where Brashad Perryman's breakout last year was valid he becomes the deep threat for Darnold Denzel Mims has the size and speed to work the vertical route tree and he so all of a sudden they become this field stretching offense with those two guys and Jamison Crowder is really good working the underneath routes maybe you steal a few receptions from Josh Doxson another size receiver on the outside and Le'Veon Bell working the underneath uh, underneath stuff too like I could I could kind of like this is what the offseason's for right if you're a Jets fan you just kind of talk yourself into the best case scenario for all these guys but it's best case scenario, right. which still probably puts him below some of these other quarterbacks in situations. I mean, that is the flip side of, of the, the concern that I laid out, right? There's a, an ins, there's not, not a considerable scenario that nothing actually got better around him. On the other hand, there is the ideal scenario for the Jets where everything they did completely transformed the offense in one offseason, right? They rebuilt an offensive line that suddenly – creeps back toward average or even beyond average, it becomes pretty good. And suddenly Darnold's got protection. It re- overhauled the receiving core where you replace Robbie Anderson with Perriman, who could be a deep threat and maybe do a little bit more in terms of contested catches and some other big plays. You bring in Denzel Mims, who in theory can do everything. You've got Jamison Crowder, who's a really good slot receiver and a weapon there. You've got Le'Veon Bell, who can be a difference maker in terms of what he does out of the backfield. In theory, you can paint a picture where everything is better. And if that happens, like Darnold goes from one of the worst situations for a quarterback in the entire league to a pretty good one. And that could immediately catapult him from being, you know, bad to being good, to being 2015 Andy Dalton, right? Where he creeps into the top 10 based off the fact that his supporting cast went from being yeah to being really good in one offseason. Yeah, I mean that's that's what the that's what Jets fans are are hoping for this year uh, in year three. So I, I think it's a pivotal year for all of them, right? Um, Lamar has had one not so good season, play by play, one incredible season. Baker, one good, one not so good. Darnold, two not so. Good. I mean, it's a pivotal year for both all of these guys. Josh Allen, can you make do with the supporting cast? Um, so can't wait to watch it all play out. A lot of information we're going to learn here in year three from these guys um so that's the 2018 quarterback class let us know in the comments what you guys think whether it's on youtube or whether it's uh on itunes we have more people leaving some itunes reviews about what they think about this stuff yeah maybe that's where they should leave their comments questions leaves your handle so you can win a free pff subscription and we'll hook you up all right we teased a little rookie of the year discussion let's go through this uh rapid fire here we have top 10 offensive rookie of the year candidates over at pff.com also the defensive rookie of the year candidates what are your thoughts handicap the offensive rookie of the year race who do you think is gonna take it we got to start with the quarterbacks because those are the easiest ones in terms of you're going to get full playing time and if you're even remotely good you you're a front runner for rookie of the year so joe burrow cincinnati i think there's a reasonable chance that this the Bengals offense is okay Um, the offensive line is the biggest thing. Jonah Williams coming back should hopefully move the needle significantly there. There are still some pretty major question marks elsewhere on that offensive line, but the receiving core could be pretty good. Obviously AJ Green should be back after missing the whole season. T Higgins was their second round pick. Tyler Boyd is a good player. Um, 
Joe Mixon out of the backfield, Gio Bernard. Like he's got some some receivers to play with. The question is, are they good enough that it offsets how bad the offensive line could be? Because that's the thing that could derail uh, Burrow's candidacy. I, I don't know if Burrow has a great season from start to finish, but I definitely envision a scenario like when Baker came in in relief on Thursday night football and led the comeback and just kind of like looked like the guy. I think there's two, three games where Burrow looks like the guy. Uh, cool under pressure, cool in, in crunch time. Uh, I, I think it, at the very least, the Bang- Bengals fans walk out of the season with some hope, uh, with, you know, feeling really good about their future based off of some late game magic or, you know, him carrying the team or whatever it is. I just feel like that's going to happen with Burrow. Um, I think with, as far as non quarterbacks go, I think the debate between either Jonathan Taylor being a high volume back in the Colts offense as a runner versus Clyde Edwards, Alaire being just a part of yeah. being like the fourth option in this Kansas city passing attack is a, is a good debate. I mean, Edwards, Alaire could stumble into 70 catches and 800 yards and 10 touchdowns uh, pretty easily here. Maybe not yeah. 10 touchdowns receiving, but you know, five receiving and another 10 rushing or something. He could easily get that. Um, and J.K. Dobbins would be the other one in terms of going to a great situation with that yeah. Ravens offense that's clearly coveted him and will presumably uh, make a lot of their running backs. So that I can imagine. I don't see a ton of like other clear, you know, guys with a real shot to do it. Rugs with the Raiders eh, feels uh, got a very optimistic interpretation of that combination of Rugs and Derek Carr. I mentioned we put him at five on this list and it comes back to one, like the list of things I can't wait to see this season. One of them is how they deploy Henry Ruggs. Do they try to justify the pick? Not only was he their wide receiver, their first rounder, he was the first wide receiver off the board. They took him over guys who are probably better equipped to be uh, high volume target guys. Do they try to make Henry Ruggs a high-volume target guy or a Deshaun Jackson? Like, you were never feeding Deshaun Jackson targets. You were scheming up a few plays where he gets behind the defense and, in general, just keeps the defense really, really scared that he's out there. Uh, But that opened up another guy who was, you know, catching most of the passes. Or are they like, Henry, every slant, it's coming to you. We're running slant flat with you all the time. We're running the vertical back shoulder game. We're moving you around. I can't wait to see if he's a 10 target a game guy or if he's, you know, we'll get it to you five or six times a game, but man, just the threat of you out there is you're worth it as our, as the 12th overall pick. So um, he's up there at five because they might feed rugs to try to justify it. And I don't know if that's the best yeah. play. I just don't think that combination of him and Derek Carr is likely to be successful enough to make him rookie of the year. Yeah. Um, what about the defensive side? Tell me why it isn't Chase Young. Uh, because tackles, maybe just because linebackers make tackles. So if Isaiah Simmons gets out there and Patrick Queen gets out there and Kenneth Murray gets out there and they make 120 tackles, um, cause, cause you know, people like to sum up a linebacker season, as long as you have triple digit tackles and then you have three, four, five sacks, three or four interceptions, which again are fluky. It looks like this incredibly well-rounded season, have a bunch of pass breakups, um, Whereas Chase Young, yeah, he should hit the ground running, but we know we also know that sack totals, he could have an eight-sack season and dominate, right? So if we're talking Chase Young, eight sacks, where he's really dominating, creating pressure off the edge, but it's only eight sacks, and, you know, maybe not Patrick Queen because they'll be on offense a lot. I think Baltimore maybe not play as many defensive snaps, but, like, Isaiah Simmons is out there with 120 tackles just because he's playing linebacker. That's how Chase Young maybe doesn't get defensive rookie of the year. It's actually interesting looking at the history of defensive rookie of the year. It's like a fairly, there was a run where it was linebacker every year. And then it's been yeah. sort of fairly consistent split since then. The last decade, a couple of defensive backs have won at Marcus Peters, Marshawn Lattimore, but otherwise it like alternates pass rusher with linebacker and the tackles, right? Nick Bosa, right. Darius Leonard, Joey Bosa, Aaron Donald, Sheldon Richardson, Luke Keekley, Von Miller, Sue. It's uh, yeah, I think, it's it's Chase Young's to lose, but you're right. The one that the one that could take it off him would be a linebacker, I think. Yeah, I think it's tough for the like Javon Kinlaw's on our list uh, as an interior defensive lineman. You know, I think it's tough for a guy like him on that deep defensive line, unless he's the guy who you know he's out there for 600 snaps, and because Bosa's getting pressure and whoever you know the other guys are getting pressure, and our Eric Armstead and he has 12 sacks just because he's you know rushing the passer right. 400 times. 
that's how he sneaks in there. Um, guy like Grant Delpit, depending on how he's deployed as a safety for the Browns, if he is used in and around the line of scrimmage more, could get a ton of tackles. You know, it, it, we're, we're not predicting who's going to be – these articles aren't predicting who's going to be the PFF rookie of the year. It's more who's going to be the NFL rookie of the year. So we're, it's almost like playing DFS. It's like playing uh, – not DFS, um, IDP here, Sam. Yeah. Fantasy with the individual defensive players. Um, I think Simmons just – I've been watching the Cardinals a lot lately, though. They were so bad covering the middle of the field, their linebackers. I think if he's just mediocre this year, that takes – they um, – they take a big step forward uh, just defensively having him there next to Jordan Hicks. So Simmons at number two on our list. Um, go check it out. PFF.com. We've got a couple write-ups on offensive and defensive rookie of the year candidates. And we're going to wrap it up with some, do we have questions here? You said, yeah, we got two questions. Um, guy successfully left us his Twitter handle. So we'll be able to actually get to him and give him his free thing. Excellent. Um, so remember, if you're leaving, leave us a question in an iTunes review of the podcast. And if you're doing that, you might as well give us five stars rather than four that I saw some people giving us. But, you know, you be you. Why did we um, get four? Did they think it was out of four? I don't they know. They must have thought it was out of four. I don't know. Uh, anyway, leave How us your question. How would we not get a five-star review? In the iTunes review, and importantly, leave us some way of getting in touch with you. Most people are going with Twitter handles. That makes sense. But, you know, do what, do what works for you. Uh, but the point is, if you don't leave a handle, we can't get to you and therefore can't actually give you the free PFF subscription. So question about data. Uh, my question for Steve and Sam is about the data they reference on the show. Oftentimes, the pair talk about how the passing game is more valuable. Defense doesn't matter. You're thinking of the forecast there. And running the ball doesn't matter. My question is that while this intuitively makes sense, what is this based on? Is it just looking at yards per attempt numbers? Or have there been full length or even published studies done on these things? I'm really looking to see which groups have looked at these factors analytically, or if it's something that's been done internally at PFF. Uh, so it's a it's a bit of both. Uh, we've got some stuff that has been published. We have other stuff that's been more internal. The, the the concept of the run game being far less valuable than the pass game isn't unique to PFF. That's been um, that's been around for a while. Um, there's been a lot of good individual studies on just the study of say play action. Right. And I think what good studies have done have said, um, here's this thought, let's either confirm it or debunk it. Right. And when it's debunked, say, say play action doesn't, you know, um, say the run game doesn't matter. Right. Um, somebody comes up with this concept of pass plays are way more valuable than run plays. And then the next question is, well, the run sets up the pass. So then the next study has generally been, well, let's see how well play action works with or without uh, previous runs or run game success or, you know, whatever it is leading up to it. And then that kind of gets debunked. So it's been a little bit of uh, external PFF studies that are out there combined with our own studies, either, conf you know, generally confirming it. Um, and then we have unique ones, which is like the whole pass rush versus coverage debate. And, you know, that's been, that's over at PFF.com. I think it's a three-part series that Eric Eager wrote. And the way he did it was essentially a uh, random forest, Sam, you know how those work. Um, he was create, he went through back in time and basically said, uh, let me see all the teams that have a really good pass rush grade as a team and a really good coverage grade as a team. And usually when you have those teams, they're all great. I mean, that's like the 2013 Seahawks. That's like the Broncos in 2015. Like those are your best defenses of all time. And then he goes back and he says, what if you only have one? What if you only have a good pass rush and below average coverage? and then vice versa. And then you kind of work through the scenarios of how often those have, have occurred. And I think it was over time, teams with a good pass rush and bad coverage were worse than the alternative, which is a good coverage team and bad pass rush. Um, and then you check it at the play level and all that stuff. And you come to the conclusion that if you had to choose a good coverage unit or a good pass rush unit, you would take the coverage unit. Now, I think what we could always do a better job of at PFF is taking these studies and further explaining them or discussing and evaluating the strategy behind implementing them. So, you know, if I'm sitting there with an NFL team and they're like, Hey, you guys told us coverage is more important than pass rush. Okay. Yeah, that's great. All right. How, what do we do with that? What, how do you, how do you build your team? Does it mean, you know, draft five corners before you draft an edge? Um, does it mean, uh, you know, who cares how good your number one corner is? You need six good ones and, and deploy your resources at, 
average players there just so you're not a disaster. There are all these different ways of implementing the strategy that I think make football fun because there's 32 different teams out there. They're all going to bring different strategies and um, financial situations and draft capital to the table to try to build their team. So I hope that answers some of it, some internal, some from other people. Um, and we do have a lot of stuff published and, and, you know, for public consumption at pff.com. Right. And a lot of it is leaning into things like EPA as opposed to just yards and, and yep. sort of basic, more basic box score numbers. Um, so we got a question that I'm going to modify a little bit because A, it didn't leave their, not their Twitter handle and B, I prefer mine better. So we were talking about the, the 2018 class of quarterbacks, but the Trubisky class it was kind of, it's been talked about recently because apparently Deshaun Watson uh, tweeted that the Bears didn't even talk to him before that draft. It's like, not only did they miss because they went Trubisky over Mahomes or Watson, but, you know, the, the discussion. So it came up because, who the hell was it? Somebody was basically saying, oh, this was race motivated, right? You know, Trubisky's white, the other two are black, or go. Um, and I think Doug, Got Doug Gottlieb was posting that, look, that's crazy. Look at it. They just missed. And they did their due diligence and all the other guys, and they just, they just misevaluated. And then Watson and tweeted. And then Watson said he never They didn't done. even talk to me. So apparently he didn't do their due diligence. So there is an interview out there from that year where he said he talked to the Bears too. So there's a right. lot of So whatever, right? The, the that part, let's just, let's, I'm, this is only what sparked this whole thing off, right? Yep. The, the, that quarterback group to me is interesting because we did the same thing in terms of missing on Trubisky. And when you, or when you sort of look back with hindsight being 2020, it looks crazy, right? Because there's a whole bunch of people that love Mahomes. There's a whole bunch of people that love Watson. Um, there's also a whole bunch of people that love Trubisky. It's just that those people are quieter now because he sucks. Um, but I think it's, it's worth revisiting what we thought of those guys at the time, what we think of them now, and how, how that happened, right? How those guys have sort of become what they've become versus what we thought they would become based on their projections coming out. All right. So I think it's a great question. It's a good discussion. And this was supposed to be a little bit tighter podcast, but now you're going to get me going for about a half hour here. Shocker. Um, I would say among these three guys, so the difference between the 2017 class and the 2018 class is for us, the 2018 class had little debate about the order of quarterbacks at the top. The 2018 class, we were all clearly like, hey, Baker Mayfield's the guy. Uh, most people agreed that Sam, there was a drop-off and that Sam Darnold was the guy, even though some people liked Josh Rosen a little bit more than Darnold. Darnold was pretty much the number two consensus. Rosen was the number three consensus for us. And then there was a legitimate debate between Josh Allen and Lamar Jackson because at a macro view, you have guys with accuracy concerns, but also um, special traits and ability that you know could play at the NFL level that we've already seen. The 2018 class ranking – internally for us was relatively easy it, it, from a data standpoint, I think was, was relatively easy. The 2017 class was not easy at all. Um, Watson had the best data. Mahomes had the best special ability. And then Trubisky had he, one year of very good play in 2016. His previous year, he threw, by the way, 47 passes. And he was incredible on those 47 passes, 40 for 47 and just tore it up and it was it didn't mean much but it just kind of like put him on our watch list um and the thing that Trubisky had going for him was oh he's a one-year starter so it was it was this like well is, because is that me does that mean he'll always get better because he's a one-year starter or does it not matter um so I think my analysis for the 2017 class we had people internally who absolutely wanted Deshaun Watson at number one guys who absolutely wanted Patrick Mahomes at number one um and then a lot of the data basically saying, hey, let's, you know, you go with Trubisky. And even after the draft, I don't think any of us said, nobody said, hey, Bears win it because they got our, the, our top graded, our top ranked quarterback. Um, we actually, I know my analysis on that was everybody went to a great situation. Um, Trubisky went to a situation which um, it didn't show it in 2017 when he got out there, but they had done a fine job in 2016 of – taking a bunch of quarterbacks and making them look pretty good. Matt Barkley looked reasonable in that system. It was the old regime. Dowell Loggins was the offensive coordinator. I thought that they would mesh with Mitch Trubisky and, and do all right. 
Um, Patrick Mahomes, the analysis was perfect situation. Incredible. I can't believe he went to the Kansas City Chiefs. Andy Reid has found a way to have success with every type of quarterback. He took the West Coast offense system, which is known, you're reading the book right now, Sam, it's a Joe Montana precision accuracy system. He made it work with Donovan McNabb, who was not accurate at all. He's going to, he's throwing ankle high passes four times a game, right? He made it work with Donovan McNabb, with Alex Smith, you know, Coach Favre, and all those guys through the, like, Andy Reid, perfect situation for Patrick Mahomes. And thought that Deshaun Watson, Watson in Houston and Bill O'Brien was going to be a nice fit as well. So, like, two out of three, we were like, hey, these are good fits. They're all first-round caliber quarterbacks. Great. Um, but I think from a ranking standpoint that year, uh, and just to go back to the previous year, here's how, we, here's how we ranked Jared Goff and Carson Wentz. Internally, there was a lot of Goff 1, Wentz 1A. We went Goff over Wentz. Um, we weren't even close with Dak. We, you know, we were much lower on him than what he's shown. But Goff and Wentz were almost interchangeable for us at the top, and that's what they looked like. We were much lower on uh, Deshaun Kaiser. And, um, oh, Paxton Lynch was our three, I think, in that, that year. Missed on Paxton Lynch. Deshaun Kaiser that year came out. Was it that year or was it the Trubisky year? Oh, he was 17. It was the Trubisky year. We had Kaiser in a whole different level. Next round, not a first-round quarterback compared to the Trubisky and Mahomes and all these guys. So my point from a ranking standpoint is 16 – we had a toss-up at the top. 17, toss-up at the top. 18, we had some pretty very specific right. uh, rankings. And this, was, this is still very early on in terms of us understanding how to – understanding, A, what the grades meant from a college point of view, and B, how to use them and all this kind of stuff. And then you get the complicating factor that even the tape analysis, the sort of scouty part of it, was not clean either, right? But let's, just the data side of things, even looking back on it, I'm not sure it's that helpful in terms of like what it would, what order it would put these three quarterbacks in. You've got Trubisky, who has the highest grade of any of the group, but as you say, it was that season where he threw 47 attempts, right? That's the best single season grade on a tiny sample size. The next year, Trubisky has a PFF grade of 87, which is the second highest single season of any of these quarterbacks after Deshaun Watson's 2016. So those two both had great seasons, but Watson had three years of that, whereas this is Trubisky has one, right? Now, what do you do with that? Do you say, well, if he's at the same level as Watson already, and he's only in his first year starting, you project that forward, right? So you can look at that two ways. You can either say it's one year starting, beware, be scared of that. Or it's one year starting and he's already at the same kind of level as these guys. If we project development, he's, he's better. And that, I think, is where we ended up, right? We sort of project – we took the optimistic view of he's this good after that one year. And that year, it was kind of like the Josh Allen thing, right? His plus plays were insane. Like he had 20% of those accurate plus throws, the perfect passes, which is absurd. And knowing what we know now, we might have been like, well, that's not sustainable. Let's ding him a bit for that. But whatever. That's where we were led by Trubisky's incredible season. Then you've got Deshaun Watson, who you've got three consistent years of basically the same grade, right? He's incredible, 85 kind of grades, three straight years. And then you've got Mahomes, who basically improved by 10 grading points every single season of his career. Went 65, 75, 85. And then in the NFL, went like 95, you know, 120. And it just continued to get better by giant steps every single year. Let me dig into PFFIQ for some answers as well here, Sam. My new uh, new product here. Right. So this Here's is the other thing. This is some of the stuff we're learning now that we didn't know back then and might have led right. somewhere else. Did it? Would it? Would it have led us somewhere different? It may have. Um, okay. It depends on how we weighted Mahomes' seasons. Because as you mentioned, if you take the entire sample size, there was nothing pointing him to greatness from a data standpoint. Right. If you combined it with traits, and you're like, man, I literally have never seen people throw the ball <laughs> certain ways that he did. I mean, we were making Brett Favre comparisons. That's a, that's a big part of it too. And even not knowing what the data said, let me just read my write-up on Mahomes on the bottom so, line. Hang on, give us the IQ thing first. And then All right, I'll give you the IQ the scouting number. part, which I think, as I say, is even more complicated. So from an IQ standpoint, this is what we're working on behind the scenes. And if you're an NFL team, you guys should be looking at this soon. Um, if you just take Mahomes last year, here's the one thing he had working in his favor. Special traits plus quit baseball. This is the first year. His last year at Texas Tech was the first year he hadn't played baseball. 
using the stable metrics, he was well above average when compared to other guys right now in our database where we have college and NFL data. All right, so the database wasn't as robust back then, but looking back right now compared to 89 guys that we've seen play in college and in the NFL for quarterbacks, he is in the 72nd percentile at avoiding negatively graded throws. So that is the most stable piece. That's the thing that, yeah, he had a bunch of turnover-worthy throws and crazy decisions at Texas Tech, but that was that's the most stable thing. He's number one. Between him, Watson, and Trubisky, he's number one at avoiding negatively graded throws. Number two is Watson, whose last season was at the 65th percentile, and then Trubisky uh, was in the 50th percentile, which is still, like, pretty good for Trubisky. He's just really disappointed um, at the NFL level. I mean, a lot of people like Trubisky. This wasn't – this wasn't Jake Locker. Right. He, wa- he wasn't um, EJ Manuel. He wasn't a guy who, like, I-, I, don't think either, I don't think Christian Ponder, I don't think those guys should have been drafted in the first round after watching those guys. You watch them and you're like, this doesn't look like a first-round quarterback. It's, it's a – Jake Locker looks like a first-round quarterback, just never played like it. Blaine Gabbert never played like a first-round quarterback, ever. Um, Trubisky did, um, and he's just been disappointing at the NFL level. So that number in particular – the stable metrics, Mahomes is above average in his last season. When you take the full body of work for Mahomes, though, he's below average, making him more of a data outlier. Um, the scouting right. report part of it. So the scouting report part of it, I think, is interesting because Trubisky, it's basically all down to how you value one season wonder, right? I think the NFL generally has been burned enough times that it's just scared of those guys generally, right? Yeah. You know, anybody with one season and one season only terrifies the NFL because it's just happened so many times. For us, certainly at the time, I think we probably skewed more positive that, hey, if he's this good after one season starting, let's project forward with some optimism. Then you get to the two really interesting guys because hindsight, you know, revisionist history, it's like, well, how did anybody have them behind Trubisky? But Mahomes, right? You watch Mahomes tape and you're like, what he's doing is insane. It's crazy. And it looks like a lot like what it looks like now. But that is unprecedented at the NFL level. The only guy that's ever really succeeded like that for any extended period of time is Brett Favre. And Brett Favre had, now it's, there are again, some comparable traits. Like Brett Favre had basically the best arm in the league. One of the best arms in league history, as does Mahomes. But when you're like looking for the next unicorn, it seems like just bad process, right? The chances that that guy is another one like that is probably pretty slim. So you're looking at what he's doing. And it's like, he's doing all this crazy stuff outside of structure. But like at some point, he's going to have to play within the structure of the offense in the NFL. And there's no evidence that he can do that. Now, to be fair, there was there's no evidence that he couldn't. It's just that he wasn't doing it at Texas Tech. So we erred on the side of, look, that's too big a question mark to have him like number one. Now, sure, the talent is so tantalizing. You still want him in the first round somewhere because like he could be what he is now. But the question, like it's, can he play within the structure of the offense? That was a significant enough question that if you had him third in your list of quarterbacks, I, it feels hard for me to say that was just stupid because the alternative well, is you say, of course you can do that. Why wouldn't he, despite no evidence that he could? The thing is too, he was, he was coveted by the New Orleans Saints and the Kansas City Chiefs. They both, the, the Saints were going to take him they they wanted him. So that's the other thing about like rankings and stuff like that. Like I'm not Sean Payton who has had a history of um, a lot of offensive success. And I'm not Andy Reed who we already mentioned all the success. However, if I'm Sean Payton or Andy Reed, absolutely. My Patrick Mahomes is my QB one. Right. Cause I'm pretty confident in what I'm going to be able to do with that skill set. Also, you know, I'll, I'll, t- I'll teach you how to play one. within structure. What's right. that? Also, I don't need him to play day one. Cause I have Drew and you didn't need him to play Alex Smith. And, and that's the other thing. It's studies on, like, guys who sit versus guys who play, they're skewed by many different things. However, Tom Brady didn't play right away. Right. Drew Brees sat for at least half a season. Aaron Rodgers sat for three years. All right, so we're already talking about the three three of the four. Um, yeah. the, the Mount Rushmore of quarterbacks since 2000, it's Brady, Manning, Rodgers, and Brees, right? Yeah. Pretty clearly. Three out of four didn't play. Mahomes is going to be on the Mount Rushmore of the next 20 years. He didn't play year one. Lamar didn't play until week 10 or 11. I mean, just say there's a, there's a lot of guys who were not thrown into the mix in week one. Now Peyton was thrown into the mix week one. He became hall of famer, one of the best of all time. Like 
there's no clean data on either right. side, but I'm really intrigued by this concept of Mahomes sat 16 straight weeks. Right. So I don't know how much, yeah, I don't know how much I would lean on the idea that, you know, sitting versus not sitting is a general concept for quarterbacks, but there, I think just zeroing in on Mahomes' situation, right? Not that he necessarily sat, but that he had a whole season to watch A, an excellent professional in Alex Smith go about what he does and how to work yep. and all that kind of stuff. And B, being taught by an Andy Reid offense and being taught within that system. I think his specific system, given what he had to improve on, right? Given that the fact, could he play within the structure of an offense was a complete unknown. He got to watch 16 game, 16 weeks of a quarterback do it and one of the best minds in the NFL teaching him what to do in terms of mental reps before he even had to try anything. That, I think, was invaluable. Whether or not the concept of sitting generally is helpful for quarterbacks. Right. So Mahomes, I think it all comes down to what you thought of that lack of data on his tape of playing within the structure of an offense. It was a question mark. In the NFL, he answered the question mark. And now, because of that, he, all the other stuff remains a positive, and he's the best quarterback in the NFL. Deshaun Watson is interesting because – so. Zach in particular, I think, had some really interesting takes on Watson, right? Yeah, he did. Uh, l- let me f- let me read the the recap of Mahomes first before we get to Watson. Okay, yeah. a couple notes from his bottom line. And by the way, his like what he does best from the PFF draft guide is just Zach like in awe of him, anticipates well, Sling great Sammy. vision. Yeah, slinging Sammy <laughs> Bach. Um, his arm is as good as any quarterback in the NFL playing right now. The natural passing instincts, as far as sliding and feeling pass rushers in the pocket, to seeing in front of the throw. And adding to the uh, or adjusting to the type of throw needed is special. Like our final ranking was just didn't match up with what our bottom line <laughs> write up was, is part of the issue as well. His lack of discipline in the pocket with footwork, bailing on clean pockets, and decision making, though, is a big concern, right? So everything on the weakness part of it, he essentially fixed. Um, and the last thing. The last line was Mahomes is not likely a day one starter in the NFL, but it's certainly worth a first round selection as a potential big hit as a franchise quarterback. So um, fine with the actual interpretation of right. I honestly, know, so I think his skill set. Right. I honestly think that the Patrick Mahomes is one that we got right. It's just that when you, you know, anytime a guy is a boom or bust thing and he booms, it's like, well, of course, I, I, you, you treat it as binary, right? It's like, well, he hit, therefore he should have been number one. So, like, well, like what were the chances of him hitting? Because that's what you're playing with, right? The The debate was not, does Patrick Mahomes have upside? It's how likely is he to hit that upside? And that's what pulled him down a little bit, was yeah. the concern and the question that we didn't know that was going to happen. So I, I would think, say honestly, that, the, eval, the eval on Mahomes was correct. He just became, right. a, he transformed himself as a player and answered all the questions we had on him. Therefore, he's the best QB in the NFL. And the data now knowing where to where to look in the data would would push him to the top of this trail right. as well um so that's Mahomes Deshaun Watson I think our concern was another one where again I went back and forth with Zach and it's like how much do you weigh this because he was a lot of one read yes in in run at Clemson and then it's it's like a chicken or the egg thing is that because that's his skill set or have they coached it and if they have coached it, have they coached it because your athleticism is special or because they don't trust you going through reads all that well? At the NFL level, that has pretty much stayed the same. Again, he's not great at getting to that next read. The same thing we said Lamar is awesome at. Like Watson's a more – we talked about this exact debate. Watson's a better thrower of the football, I think, than Lamar, throw for throw. But Lamar is more willing to go through progressions and he does it more efficiently and he's better. Um, so we had some questions about that from Deshaun Watson. But then when you just look at the pure production – after the two, his his uh, true freshman season in 2014, I remember writing that he was the best quarterback prospect in the nation. He was. I mean, he was incredible as a true freshman. Came in and he just he just looks the part right away, um, and he was just consistently productive in that Clemson system. So um, I think we overthought some of how he did it when the data also pointed toward him being very very good and we just overthought that he has played differently at the nfl level though because he's made some of those late in the down plays that he probably wasn't making in college nearly as much as a passer right but so that was the big concern with him right it's that so much of what he was doing 
was one read and then run. And that for an NFL quarterback is terrifying because those players, the guys that succeed, the guys that are one read and run players are not typically good quarterbacks. They can be special athletes and they can make something happen. But ultimately that usually leads to a career that, you know, it hits the ground running or makes an impact somewhere along the line then craps out after a couple of years when teams figure that out and just take away right. your first read and force you to do something else and you struggle. So again, this was, it was a case of what do you weigh? And we were saying, well, that is a really concerning potential flaw yet in our, in college, it hasn't come back to bite him yet, but in the NFL level, everything's harder. And there's a history of those guys, not necessarily, uh, not necessarily succeeding long-term. So we were kind of scared off by that, even though body of work, you probably say uh, Watson is the cleanest of all these guys, three straight years of great, like his grades were like between 85 and 90 every year. Um, yeah. Three straight years of that. And it worked in college. And as you say, the more advanced numbers that we didn't necessarily have access to then would have pushed him as well. So I think we just, we overemphasized the concern more than the upside. Uh, the other thing too, you and I did the uh, the Sports Illustrated draft show a couple of years and Andy Staples is on the show and he's a college football beat writer. You know, he knows college football inside and out and they always laugh when they have to cover the draft and they, they hear the last four months of scouts just you know, tearing apart guys and b building them up when they shouldn't be and all this stuff. And he's like, if you just watch college football for the last three years, you know Deshaun Watson's awesome. So just trust that. Like college football writers are pretty good at evaluating quarterbacks. I covered this guy. He was really good. He'll be good at the next level. So they had, they were like, Watson's awesome. Mahomes is awesome. We saw him go head to head with Mayfield with a lesser team and throw for 800 yards on prime time. Go with Mahomes. Um, to be fair, Trubisky had those moments too. He had a great comeback against Florida State and he, he did some great things. He took a UNC program that wasn't great and made it good for a year. Um, I think I had more reservations about specifics to Trubisky's game which was like blitz recognition, intermediate accuracy. And this goes down to how do you weigh things, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have, here's five strengths and here's five weaknesses. I think Trubisky's five weaknesses were more concerning as far as what translates to the NFL uh, than maybe I knew at the time. Honestly, I think what we did is we looked at each one of these guys had upside and they had downside and what we did is we leaned into the downside on two of them and leaned into yeah. the upside on the other one right with Trubisky that's fair downside was one year starter and you can look at that two ways you can look at that either as a you know, massive concern because it's one year of data and it can be easily plunge back down to earth or you can say look at it positively and say hey it's one year and he's already this good projected forward that's what we did the other two it was Mahomes who got a question mark about whether he can play in structure Let's ding him a little bit because of that. And with Watson, it was we've got a concern about what happens in the NFL where they take away that first read. And now you've got to go through progression and you've got to work further into your, your play than he has at Clemson. And we, again, heard on the negative. We pushed both those guys down a few spots, whereas if anything, we elevated Trubisky a couple of spots because we were projecting a positive slant on his negative. So Here's um, looking at IQ again. Roundup. So, again, at the time, we didn't realize – that play under pressure was far more unstable. We were very much like right. the rest of the world who's like, let me see this guy play under pressure. Uh, and so Trubisky was, let me watch this guy play on third down, right? Trubisky was well above average, even when compared to other guys in the draft class. In his final season, above average in all of our unstable metrics. So play under pressure, he had an above average PFF grade that last year. Play outside the pocket, third and fourth down uh, grade. He was 81st percentile compared to other guys that have been drafted over the last few years, play action grade and positively graded throws, the things that tend to fluctuate more. Um, those rankings were far higher than all of the stable metrics that we, again, has taken us a few years to really know uh, what's stable and unstable when projecting guys. So, um, yeah, I think, that's, I think that's a good breakdown of what we thought at the time, what we've learned a little bit more now, and maybe how um, even the data right now might, rearrange them right um, and ultimately it's my fault i had the final say on these rankings and i, I screwed it up sam well that's the important part is that, it's all that is the fault. important part it's 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 all my fault perfect you know um here's one other thing i think right what people say about quarterbacks i don't know if this is just what overrating them in these situations 
But there was just this incredible feeling that Patrick Mahomes, I hate using it factor all the time, but that he just, his dad was a pro and he knew how to be a pro and he quit baseball and he progressed. Like there were these things pointing to Mahomes is going to figure it out. Watson had Dabo Sweeney calling him Michael Jordan, which coincided with two years of him, you know, dominating. They beat, you know, he beats Bama in the national championship, like all these different things like that dude just had it. Like he's going to go out there and figure it out and succeed. And he had people saying that and people were saying the same thing about Mahomes. I don't know if you got that sense of people saying that from Trubisky, the things I heard about Trubisky were like, ah, he's a little quirky. And I don't know if he really loves it and wants it. And, and you know, we joke about weighing those things too much a lot, a, a lot of the time, but I think at the quarterback position where there are so many variables and you always point to the greats, like you're always trying to say like, well, Brady's like that and Breeze is like that. And Rogers is like that. Like you just, you want to try to at least get stuff that looks like, the guys that are awesome. And like people are going to be looking for, for Mahomes types now and Watson types um, in how they act and approach things because there's this path of success. Yeah. I mean, going back even further, I like to say, I'm, I'm diving into this as a topic at the moment, but that was all you ever heard about Joe Montana. No matter how many yeah. interceptions he threw to the opposition, it was like fourth quarter, Joe's going to get it done. Don't worry about it. Like this is what he does. We're, we're good. Yeah. Like he had, yeah. it was, it was, fact right people had that opinion of him that we everything is exactly where we want it to be because joe montana is the quarterback and he'll bring us back that's what he does yeah. um so it's not like you know you need to be able to play as well but you you probably certainly shouldn't be overlooking that as a thing right if somebody has that in addition to being a pretty good prospect that's probably important <sighs> i think that covers it man that's true yeah. montana did have it Joe cool. We also used many Brett Favre comparisons for Patrick Mahomes. So yeah. I think that was fair. Did you see the video that I tweeted the other day of like, it's, it's Gruden's QB camp thing. He had Brett Favre in there and just had videos of him from practice, just wrecking his receiver's fingers with these lasers <laughs> that had no business being really? lasers. And he spent the entire time being like, you know, my poor guy here had to tape up all of his hands just to catch these things. And Brett, Brett's like, yeah, I probably could have taken a little bit off that one, to be fair. <laughs> it's just like a like, 10-yard hitch, and he's literally just throwing his life into this thing. Like, the follow-through, his hand is, like, down by his ankle. It's just It's yeah. insane. I've never seen anybody like, just rip a laser the way he does. Speaking of no touch, but, yeah, he was the first. Classic. Uh, there's a history. I hate the term system quarterback, but – when people go back and Montana wasn't special statistically coming out of Notre Dame, even for its, for his time, Favre wasn't special statistically coming out of Southern Miss. I mean, the system quarterback, so to speak, was this whole tree of West coast systems, starting with Bill Walsh, who took guys who were like PFF data probably would have been terrible back then. Right. It would have been because the, the traits that these guys had and the development that Bill Walsh took them through plus plus just passing instead of running or like just saying we're going to pass on first down and we're going to pass on second down a lot more often. We're going to throw to the backs and make you more efficient helped Joe Montana develop incredibly statistically and Steve Young and Brett Favre in this like tree of quarterbacks that just helped uh, shape the, the pass game as it, as it is today. Guys that just developed um, when the stats maybe didn't say that they should. And even in that, you know, even in his Notre Dame career, Montana had that thing of, like, he's the guy that will bring you back. He'll like, bring you back. He's the Brady was kid. called, sorry, Brady was called the comeback kid at Michigan. Hmm. And he only played a year and a half, really, right. of football. And he was still not the guy Honestly, for a like, bunch the of more, the time. The more, you, the more you read about Montana, the, the closer the parallels are between his career and, and Brady's, right? They yeah. both had this, neither one of them was a surefire thing in college. And yet the, all the evidence said they probably should have been, you know what I mean? Like yeah. Brady's in this battle with Drew Henson for God knows what reason. Joe Montana couldn't win the job in Notre Dame because they kept putting in somebody else. It's like, dude, yeah. he's better than the guys you're putting him in competition with. Just give him the job. It's, it's so fascinating looking back. There's a lot of, a lot of art to the quarterback evaluation process. So uh, it's a good question. It took up a lot of time, but I think it was worthwhile looking back on, on what we thought of these guys the last couple of years. So uh, thanks to everybody for tuning in this week. 
Uh, the PFF All Decade 101, the 2019, uh, 10 to 19 All Decade team. Uh, we put the team out a few weeks ago, but we've actually ranked the 101 best players in the NFL during the last decade. We'll be breaking that down on Thursday. Sam's writing it up all week. Him and I helped. Uh, we put the list together uh, based off PFF grades and roles and all that stuff. So it should be a lot of fun. Tune in on Thursday. And Sam's been hinting at a lot of really fun offseason content that we're working on, trying to make it uh, detailed, in-depth, and, and really, really good for you guys. Are you ready to tease any of it yet, Sam, or are we, do you want to wait? Well, yeah, we can probably do it. We are working on a, uh, an off-season podcast series that is effectively like an oral history of, you know, certain key NFL historical interesting times. So whether it's Joe Montana, whether it's a rookie Randy Moss just laying waste to the NFL landscape, whether it's <laughs> quarterbacks, Manning versus Leaf, how that happened. Like, how are those two in competition as a pre-draft evaluation how didn't we see that coming all these kind of things we're going to talk to people get some interviews get some game footage and cool sounds have us breaking it down on the podcast and we'll have these kind of cool shows uh, up and running for you the first one that we're working on now is that randy moss episode it's you know what was rookie randy moss coming in leading the nfl in touchdowns leading this 98 minnesota vikings offense it was basically unstoppable all the way to the championship game what the hell was that like and how did it happen? Yeah, so it's been a lot of fun already just starting. We're just scratching the surface, a lot more to come. Let us know if you guys have any um, somewhat recent topics. I think uh, late 80s, 90s, early 2000s are probably the sweet spot uh, for from a timing standpoint. We can go on either side of that if necessary, but let us know if you guys have any specific topics you'd like for us to potentially get into depth and, and research and, and you know, do a, an entire show on. So thanks to everybody for tuning in. Uh, hope you're staying safe, uh, enjoying the offseason, enjoying the NFL schedule release party last week. Uh, we'll be back Thursday discussing the All-Decade 101. You want to get rid of me and get back to more great PFF YouTube content? All you have to do is push that button right there and subscribe. Thanks for watching.